live broadcast today, uh, focused today on pulmonary rehab. So yesterday was supposed to be the first day of spring, but for those of you in the Northeast, I know you've snowstormed Toby on the way, but hopefully soon with the weather improving, it'll be time to get outside and try and be more active. So today we decided to invite world-renowned pulmonary rehabilitation expert, Dr. Noah Greenspan, to advise you on how pulmonary rehab can help you with pulmonary fibrosis. And Noah's in New York, so we can ask him for a weather update also. Welcome, Noah. How are you doing today? Thanks so much. Here's my weather update. Check it out for yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eamon. It's my pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. And hello to our home audience, hopefully all around the world. Um, I, I, before we start, I just want to say that anything we discuss today is basically um, general information. It's not a specific recommendation for you. And so therefore, anything that we discuss, please, by all means, discuss with your physician before trying to implement anything that we talk about. Excellent, sounds really good. So um, maybe before we get to some of the, the audience questions that are coming in already, and we had a few in advance of the broadcast, um, you know, I suppose I had the good fortune of visiting you and seeing your your center in New York. Um, so it's also be worthwhile kind of describing what you do there, but then maybe start to talk uh, about the differences and you know what people can do at home that maybe isn't quite as good as as what you do in the clinic, but uh, some general tips that people could be doing at home. Sure. So, um, so what we do in New York is, is we basically, we have a full service cardiovascular and pulmonary rehabilitation facility. And we see everyone from pulmonary fibrosis patients to COPD, to sarcoid, to cystic fibrosis, to heart patients and heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. The common thread between most of our patients is shortness of breath. And you know, the, the thing about shortness of breath is that when we talk about any type of illness or, or, or condition where the issue is not like a broken leg or a broken arm or a stroke, when we're talking about systemic issues, um, they have a way of sort of cycling and snowballing into each other. And there's the primary impact of the condition, but then there's the secondary impact of the adaptation to the condition. And so as much of what we do as far as exercise, we want to be able to teach people how to manage their own disease. Um, not to say without a physician, not to say without a nurse or a healthcare team or a rehab team, but I always feel that the more educated a patient is, the greater ability they have to help themselves. Um, I describe it as if like you were shipwrecked you know, and there's, you know, you don't know what's around you. I want to swim as fast as I can. I don't want to wait and see what weather, what animals from the sea that the, the, the ocean has for me. I want to take some control over this. So a big part of what we do is exercise and that's monitored exercise. So as our patients exercise, everyone is hooked up to an EKG the entire time they exercise. Um, they're, we're checking their blood pressure every three to five minutes and we're checking their oxygen saturation every three to five minutes. And for those who need oxygen, we can provide as much oxygen as they need. Um, and that's pretty much what we do at our center. Now, what people can do at home is a lot. Um, you know, one of the things about fibrosis and um, activity and shortness of breath is that typically when people start to get short of breath, it happens at high levels of activity. So things like stair climbing, walking uphill, um, running for the bus or walking quickly. And the problem with that is that very often this is scary to people and they often will attribute it to, oh, I'm out of shape or I'm getting old or, you know, um, you know, I've put on some weight, this and that. Um, and so, they tend to make adaptations and either avoid or limit or modify the activities that cause them discomfort. And as a result, all of the body parts, muscles and systems that do those activities, um, including the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the musculoskeletal system, endocrine and neurologic, all become less efficient. And then people start to get short of breath at lower levels of activity 
and then they find ways to modify those. Now, when you're diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, the game, the game is that if you do nothing, it's definitely going to get worse. Okay. So doing nothing is not an option. So every time you are standing still doing nothing, we're losing ground. So we must be moving and we must be active in order to do what we can to keep this condition at bay. I really like that, you know, doing nothing is not an option and, and people need to take control. So I think those are, those are, kind of key things so uh, you know as if someone can even only do a small bit at first they should be doing a small bit at first you know it, you, you say you say that and and I want to just clarify my my position on what you're saying too you say if they can only do a small bit at first okay um you know the name of our center is, is wellness okay so I don't I don't just you know the idea of rehab is you got into a car wreck and you now we have to build you back okay Part of what I try to get people to understand is that we would rather, you know, we want to build up as much bank account or health wealth as we can so that if things go wrong, okay, and with pulmonary fibrosis, there's a fair chance that things are going to occur that are going to challenge you, that are going to be considered, my 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 dogs are going crazy right now, so I'm sorry <laughs> that they're Not making the snowstorm. stuff on earth. Um, but the idea is that, you know, if you think of your health as a bank account, OK, every time you do something positive for yourself, that's like putting money in the bank. Every time that we do something negative for ourselves, that's like making a withdrawal. And like anything else in life, if we want to live the best lives for as long as we can, the more health wealth you put into that bank, when something goes wrong, the greater reserve we have. And so, yes, it's true that if you can only do a little bit at a time, that's that's what you should start with. But even more importantly, okay, when you get a diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis, that clock is ticking, okay? That means like the starting gun has gone off. That means get yourself in gear and let's build, okay? So whatever you can do now, we want to improve upon that. We want to maintain that. We want to keep that. We don't want to wait till, you know, you, you can't walk across the room. So, you know, that brings up another point, which is that with pulmonary fibrosis, one of the most challenging things is early diagnosis, right? It, and, and now, thankfully, after, you know, X number of years, I started treating pulmonary fibrosis patients in 1995 when PF patients or IPF patients were not even afforded rehab because the idea was you're too sick for rehab or your oxygen saturation is too low for rehab or your... Um, you know, you're, you're too weak for rehab. So you're too weak, you're too sick, and your vital signs, quite frankly, scare the crap out of the staff, okay? So you were told, guess what? You're too sick for rehab or rehab isn't for you. So that is to me like Alfred Hitchcock's movie Lifeboat where it's like, what should you do then? Go home, wait to die, right? That doesn't give a, a very hopeful scenario. But the fact of the matter is that there is a lot that you can do, but the key is to grab the bull by the horns right off the bat to as soon as that diagnosis is made, but even or just even more important or just as important is getting that early diagnosis. Whereas shortness of breath was always associated with asthma or emphysema, finally, and depending upon where you are, this will vary widely, but we have to at least when the, when, when the, the situation doesn't look like asthma and it doesn't look like COPD. We have to look further and we have to look at the interstitial lung diseases of which pulmonary fibrosis is one. And then getting the right diagnosis is so crucial and getting the right diagnosis early is so crucial. Getting the right diagnosis is crucial because, you know, the treatments for some interstitial diseases are actually harmful to other interstitial lung diseases. And the reason why it's so early is because everybody reads about pulmonary fibrosis and the first thing that scares them is they see something that says the average person will live three to five years from diagnosis, right? And that's a terrifying number right there. And somebody's gonna say, well, wait a second, I'm 45 years old. Does that mean I'm gonna die when I'm 50? And the answer is, 
We don't really know, but let's stack the odds in your favor. Up until recently, you know, the thinking was sort of, well, you know, why test for it? Because there's not any treatments for it, okay? Now there are treatments for pulmonary fibrosis, but unlike some of the treatments for other disorders, don't get the idea that you're gonna start taking um, one of the medications for pulmonary fibrosis and you're gonna go back to your pre-diagnosis or your pre-shortness of breath. No, these are like a stopper, okay? So these stop the leak ideally if they work for you, but then now let's build up and re restore the damage that that leak has caused. Yeah, it makes, makes sense. sense. Uh, uh, make make the deposit early, early and it'll, it'll pay dividends in the longer run. run. So let's, let's, let's start getting to some of the audience uh, questions. So uh, Risa um, came in with a question before the broadcast um, that she's getting a harmonica from a rehab person for breathing exercise. Have you come across people trying this? I have. I mean, there's absolutely a, a movement. Um, you know, there's a, a movement for harmonicas for health. And I, I applaud that. You know, I think that anything you can do to add to the mix that's going to be fun for you, that's not going to be a drag for you, that is going to give you some control is a plus. Now, I don't, you know, want to have the idea that, um, you know, I don't want people to have the idea that they're going to start playing the harmonica and playing the harmonica is going to get them to be able to walk up the hill. OK, um, now Carol's saying she's had a harmonica from the first day of rehab. She's had such fun with it. She's got a repertoire of 10 numbers. I think that should be the next broadcast of Carol playing her 10 numbers. Um, but the idea is that it's great as a plus, as an adjunct, okay? So I don't think that if you have pulmonary fibrosis and you can no longer walk up and down stairs or walk up a hill or you're confined to the house, don't expect that harmonica to be your number one meat of the meal, okay? And you know I'm using that as an example, um, but as an adjunct, it's okay. I still think that you need vigorous exercise um, you know, there's a very simple formula that I that I say, which is that your body gets good at doing what you ask it to do. So if your goal is to be a concert harmonica player, then, yeah, that's the, the exercise you want to do. I'm not downplaying the harmonica. But what I'm saying is that if, if the harmonica is not going to get you to be able to walk up a hill, if you want to be able to walk up a hill, you have to walk up a hill. You want to be able to walk upstairs, you have to walk upstairs. There's a very famous physical therapist named Shirley Sarman, and she used to say that whatever you can't do, that's your that's your rehab. So the harmonica is great. I'm all for it. It's fun. It shouldn't be the first line of rehab as opposed to, let's say, a treadmill or a bike or a new step or something else. Yeah, I, I know the uh, the British Lung Foundation in the UK um they support singing for breathing uh classes as well and i think the idea a bit like the harmonica that you're saying it's intended to complement other other forms of exercise and it's it's something fun to do absolutely and that's great i mean that's a great thing to do okay does it improve your breath control yes a little bit but it's going to improve your breath control while you're playing the harmonica okay it's going to improve your breath control while you're singing but everything is based on supply and demand Right. So when we're sitting here doing nothing, the demand for oxygen is very low. So most people are OK when they sit. But when you start to get active again, so like if this is my exercise, this is more than sitting here doing nothing. But that's not very aerobic and that's not much of a demand. So maybe my heart will beat one extra beat per minute. OK, but once you get up and start moving like and there are many people with COPD or, or pulmonary fibrosis who will say, you know what, as long as I'm sitting, I'm fine. But when I walk to the bathroom, my oxygen plummets. OK, so, yes, singing is. Listen, I'm a musician. I love music. I love dancing. I love, you know, singing. OK, all these things are great in as an adjunct. But again, you need to you know, it's like saying, well, you know, you, when you when you got that, um, you know, that TV dinner, it's like your mom's not just going to let you eat the apple pie. You have to eat the Salisbury steak also. I, I take it the purple uh, on in your office and your robe is a tribute to Prince. It, it it's not really. It's 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 we love Prince, but uh, but this is my home. This is not my office, actually. So oh, okay, okay. This is my home. It, it is. It has been called Paisley Park before, though. <laughs> 
Okay, let's get to the next question. Um, it's it's a long, complex one from Carol. And I, I, I don't think we can get to, to all of it. Um, actually, even when I put it up on the screen, it, it, it hides the whole screen. Um, but to summarize, um, I think she was treated for cancer and now she's been diagnosed with uh, pneumonitis. Um, she's currently on steroids due to stop soon. Her doctor has scheduled arterial blood gas analysis and a six minute walk test. Um, so one thing she's asking is, what is a six minute walk test and what information would she get from the ABG? Um, she's suffering a lot from breathlessness and low SATs right now. She can't really do anything around the house uh, without oxygen, but she still uses a treadmill at home uh, with oxygen. Now, I know from um, watching one of your previous webinars, um, you're not a fan of, of the six minute walk test. It, it doesn't. Um... I mean, if it's all you've got, it's OK, but it's it's not the best measure. OK, so let's let's start. So let me just say this. OK, anything I'm going to say. Yes, it, it 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 is for IPF. But it's also for COPD and it's also for pulmonary hypertension or congestion. It's for any patient because I don't come to you as an IPF patient. When someone comes to see me, I don't say, okay, this is my patient with IPF. Therefore, I'm going to do my IPF evaluation. No. Okay. I have an evaluation that is comprehensive for all patients because what happens a lot of times is people get stuck in what we think of as tunnel vision where you come in and we say you have IPF. Therefore, in my mind, I have this whole list of things that are associated with IPF, like breathlessness, like hypoxemia, like a, a dry cough, okay? But you may not have that, okay? Which is why every patient must be treated as an individual. And I don't leave it up to the patient to, um, you know, to tell me everything. I have to ask, oh, I have to ask, there are questions um, just give me one second because there's something I printed out. While we're waiting for Noah to come back, uh, Noah's also the uh, author of a book, uh, Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness. Um, so we can get to that at some stage as, as well. Thank you. Thank you. So in other words, when I, when I see a patient, okay, I do something called a systems review. So first of all, I, I, I start my evaluation by, by saying to the patient, what's giving you difficulty? And almost everybody is going to say, I'm short of breath. I can't breathe. I can't walk. Okay. So then my questions, it's almost like a flow sheet. Okay. I think in today's medical system, things have become very sort of like um, knee jerk where you're wheezing, therefore you must have asthma, you know, or you have pain over here, you must have a rotator cuff, or you have some heartburn, you must have reflux. And the fact of the matter is, it's really not always like that, okay? And, and uh, that's how a lot of mistakes can get made. The, if, you, if you've ever watched the show Gregory House MD, you know that his team starts out with 20 different diagnoses and they rule them out until they know what they have. So, the first thing I say to my patient is, why are you here? I give them an opportunity to tell me everything they want to tell me, okay? But the thing is that there's research that shows that very often the patient's first complaint is not their chief complaint, meaning the first thing they tell you is not always the most significant for them. So patients come in, they're nervous, they're in a new place, they're not necessarily thinking clearly, and they may just say, you know, it happens to me sometimes. I went to a doctor, I was like, how could I not remember to mention this, okay? So another piece of advice is be organized before you go for your treatments. Write down the things so that you're not sitting there wasting time trying to remember your medications, trying to remember your conditions, because some doctors, you go in there, I, I had a doctor who wanted to schedule me for a 10-minute appointment. I was like, I know this is not going to be the doctor for me. And there's another thing. There's a book called How Doctors Think. And in it, they say that it's under a minute before the doctor cuts the patient off for the first time. So the patient starts speaking, doctor cuts you off within 37 seconds, right? You don't get the full picture that way. So for example, when I start my initial evaluation, I'll say, do you have any neurologic problems, okay? And people might say neurologic, maybe you don't even know what neurologic is. So it's really important that the medical team speaks in the language that the patient can understand. So I say, do you have any neurologic problems? By that I mean, have you ever passed out, dizziness, stroke, seizure, okay? And then it becomes, if it's no, we move on. If it's yes, we have to go back and, and rediscover that. And same thing with shortness of breath, okay? So for example, 
have you ever passed out or do you get dizzy? That could be a, neuro, a neurologic thing. That could be a, a cardiovascular thing. It could be an anxiety thing. Then I go on, you know, to head, head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. I say, do you get a lot of headaches? Um, do you have double vision or blurry vision, cataracts, glaucoma, sinus trouble, sore throat, hoarse voice, things like that? Have you ever been told you have asthma or COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis? But you have to ask these questions, okay? You have to ask, are you coughing? So, Carol, back to your question. I know this is a roundabout way of saying it, but rather than give somebody a specific instruction or a specific set of things to memorize, I like to teach people how to think, and I like to teach people not what did he tell me I should do on that broadcast that snowy day in March, but hmm, my doctor is doing this. What do I think I need to do for myself here? So the arterial blood gases, okay, are going to give you the most accurate reading and the partial pressures of your blood gases. So things like oxygen, carbon dioxide. OK, so it's things like that, that, you know, we're getting an indirect measure of that from a pulse oximeter. OK, that's a direct measure where the arterial blood, which is going to be more oxygenated than venous blood. Right. Because that has just come from the pulmonary circulation. Now, a six minute walk test. OK, as it sounds like lasts for six minutes. And the idea is we want you to in those six minutes walk as far as you can, and we're gonna get a number in terms of feet or meters, um, or if you really like torturing yourself, inches or centimeters. Um, but the thing is that, um, you know, with this, you should be measuring vital signs, right? Why don't I like the test? I don't like the test because there are so many variables involved in this test that can change your results and make it not reproducible. So in order for a test to be valuable to you, it's got to be reproducible. In other words, the reason why we use a scale and the reason why we have to calibrate a scale is because when we use it, we're going to get consistent measurements. If, the, if every time you know we, we use it, we get a different result or an inconsistent result, that test doesn't give us a lot of valuable information. So the six-minute walk test, number one, it's patient control, right? So the patient is going to make a decision. Uh, they're either going to decide it in their head which I always say to people, don't let your, don't make a, don't set your limitations in your head before your body tells you this, or they may just want to be comfortable, or they may want to avoid discomfort, or they may be afraid, or I've actually heard people say, don't do, do too well on the test, or they're going to take away your rehab. And I'm like, what are you talking about? But the patient has the ability to control that. When I put you on a treadmill, okay, and a lot of people have a terrible mindset of the treadmill. Their only experience with the treadmill may be when they had a stress test, right? And they say, oh, I failed the stress test. You know, they put me in a chair. I almost passed out, blah, blah, blah. But you have to use the right protocol, okay, in order to do the treadmill. The treadmill, you can't, do, you can't set your own pace. The patient can't set their pace because if they don't walk fast enough, they're going to be off the back of the treadmill, right? I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm just saying that it's it's a way for us to control and standardize the test. The other thing is how you give instructions to people is very important, okay? And there's a standard set of instructions for the six minute walk test. And in most situations, it's not, it's not given that way, okay? It's like when you take the SATs, which Eamon here in, in the US, that's like your high school, you know, your test that you take to get into college. The proctor is going to say to you, you have 15 minutes for this test. If you have this, they're going to read something off of an instruction sheet. They're not going to say, well, you could do what you wanted. And unfortunately, when people do six minute walk tests, they do them very differently depending upon where it is. So some places they'll walk around the track. Some places they'll walk around the rehab center. Some places they walk back and forth. And all these things affect the test, right? So if you have to turn around 20 times in the same distance that somebody doesn't have to turn around, that doesn't make sense. The other thing I don't like about it is that very often the vital signs are not taken in real time, right? So mm -hmm. we know your heart rate, but in addition to heart rate, 
I want to know your heart rhythm. That's why I use EKG for every patient. Everybody, when we said, you know, we're opening a pulmonary rehab center 20 years ago, people were like, why are you getting EKGs? They're pulmonary patients. I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm getting EKGs because a lot of things that are pulmonary in nature can also be cardiac in nature. So uh, we could have 10 people in the same room. They could all have a heart rate of 110 and they could all have different rhythms, okay? About two weeks ago, we caught somebody completely asymptomatic. He had a potentially lethal arrhythmia, okay? And because we were able to get him to the emergency room very quickly, okay, everything was okay. But EKG is very important because then I see it the whole time. Also, when you're walking, the pulse oximeter is not always going to be accurate during activity. And that includes both heart rate and oxygen saturation. So a lot of times, it's not even kept on the whole time, okay? So some people will take it before and after. But again, if you wanna know how a plane flies and you check it on the runway before you leave and then you check it on the runway after you land, you get no information about the pressure in flight, right? So vital signs have to be taken while the person is exercising. You have to make sure you're getting a good clean reading on oxygen saturation. And you also have to make sure in order to do that, that the person, you know, sometimes if people have cold hands, if they have, um, you know, other type of conditions like Raynaud's or circulatory, like, you know, like scleroderma, you're not going to get a good reading on the finger. OK, so you have to as a rehab center or as an individual, if you know that you have scleroderma and you can't get a reading on your on your finger, then you got to have a forehead thing. OK, you got to You have to have the right tools to reg to measure the right things. You have to look for the right things. So that's why I don't love the six minute walk test. The other thing is that heart rate and oxygen saturation can return to normal very, very quickly. So the person can be very short of breath, their oxygen saturation can be very low and their heart rate can be very high. The second they sit down, by the time somebody gets done fumbling around with that oximeter and we find a good finger that we can get a reading on, guess what? We've lost the most important data because I want to know that information when you're at your worst, right? To know how you are when you're at your best is almost useless because everyone, when you're at your best, yeah, it's great. If you have a problem, it's like an EKG. An EKG is like a photograph in time, okay? So you could have a perfect EKG. You could walk out of the doctor's office and, and your rhythm changes. So that's why it's really important to get information at the time and under the conditions that cause you the most difficulty. Everybody sitting on the table at the doctor's office should have normal numbers, right? Not everybody does, but if you have a problem when you're sitting and doing nothing, now you have a, a serious problem. Sherry's asking, what happens to a pulse ox when fake nails are on? Turn it to the side, okay? So turn it so it's not on the nail. The other thing is that, um, you know, if, you, if your hands are cold, use, um, use hand warmers. We have hand warmers. So like if we know somebody has, we give them a hand warmer about, you know, five, 10 minutes before we do it. But again, if you can't get the reading, then there's forehead sensors, which are the most accurate or equally accurate, you know, for people that have difficult time getting readings. Um, but as a rehab center, you know, you can't dabble in this stuff. You know, you have to really, and that's what I find, you know, my biggest qualm with some of these people are, is that, you know, everybody wants to open a pulmonary rehab, right? But Part of the problem is that if you don't have this experience and you don't have people who have done this day in, day out, okay, what happens is a patient gets short of breath or their lips turn blue or their saturation hits 70% and the whole team is panicked, right? And, you know, if I'm on a plane and I hit turbulence, I look at my flight attendants, right? If I look at the flight attendants and they look scared, I'm scared. And I say to my patient, I say, don't worry about the numbers. Let me worry about the numbers. If I look calm, you stay calm. If I look scared, you run. OK, but the team has to be tuned up. This is not something, again, same principle, which is that, you know what? Anyone can run a situation when everything goes right. OK, but you're tested by what happens when something doesn't go right. Um, you know, I'll tell you how I, I started treating pulmonary, you know, pulmonary fibrosis patients and how I, you know, really developed my protocols. In 1995, my mentor, Dr. Horatio Pineda, who, you know, I wouldn't be where I am without him 
today, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today without his guidance and also that of Dr. Mariano Ray, who was a cardiologist and Dr. Pineda was a rehabilitation physician. Um, we were seeing pulmonary fibrosis patients, okay? All of a sudden they'd be referred to our stop because they'd send us these patients when everything has been tried and nothing worked. And they said, well, you know what? Try pulmonary rehab. And we'd see these patients, they'd come in, they'd be sitting in their chair, resting at 90% or resting at 85%, because as compared to, let's say, a COPD patient, and not that it can happen with a COPD patient, but particularly the patients with the interstitial lung diseases, their SATs go low, okay, because there's a big problem with perfusion, right? So if you see somebody and their saturation is 80% and their lips are blue and, you know, they're breathing 40 breaths per minute and they're on two liters of oxygen by cannula. We have a problem here, right? So my, my mentor and I, we started saying, you know what? Everybody's rejecting these patients from pulmonary rehab. They're sending them home to die, basically, putting them out of the lifeboat. If that's the case, right, we really have nothing to lose here, right? We have to try it. So what's going to happen? Either we, we do it quick or we, or we do it slow, okay? So what did we do? First of all, we eliminated using the cannula, okay, because a cannula is a low flow thing, okay, and think back to supply and demand. So when people are sitting here, the demand is low. When they want to walk up a hill, the demand is higher. So when the demand is higher, that's where your limitation is going to be the greatest. So we started increasing oxygen flow, right? So you come in two liters, four liters, six liters, and we will give you as much oxygen as it needs to keep you saturated. Now, there are gonna be some people who no matter what, you could give them 25 liters per minute of oxygen by a mask, they're still gonna desaturate a little bit, but not many, okay? But those people are, you say, well, how are they walking around? They've made some adaptations to that already, okay? But what a lot of places will do is your saturation goes to 88%, okay, let's slow the treadmill down. Or your saturation went to, to 88%, ha have you sit down till it comes back up? That makes no sense, right? It's like if every time your baby cries, you give them a bottle, your baby never learns to stop crying, right? And the idea, and I say that as somebody who has no experience with babies, let me just say that. So you're 100% right. <laughs> don't send me any, don't send me any hate mail from the parents, okay? But the idea is that if your life requires this, right? I can exercise you down here till the cows come home, but your life doesn't get any better. If your life requires this, I will do whatever I have to to exercise you up here. And that may mean giving you 100% oxygen with a mask. And then people start to get better. And that's what we did. And sure enough, a lot of people believe it or not, we're anaerobic at rest. And what does that mean? Okay, so we have aerobic metabolism, which is a very efficient way. And eventually your body gives up because you start becoming more acetic. These people were anaerobic at rest, meaning even sitting and doing nothing, they're working so hard to breathe that they're spilling lactic acid into their bloodstream, okay? For that patient, we have to start very, very slow, but I'd rather get that patient way upstream. But the idea is, as opposed to lowering the, the rehab, to the, the, what the patient can do now. No, let's give them all the tools they need. Let's give them as much oxygen as they can, even if it takes 25 liters of oxygen. But guess what? Those patients get better. And everybody thinks that you can't improve lung function. You can improve lung function if you work the patient vigorously enough. You, uh, you used the, the airplane analogy. When I visited your, um, your wellness center, I, I was thinking NASA. So you know, you've got everyone wired up, you've got all of the stats. So um, that point you made around, you know, measuring someone before and after, you might miss things. So it's, it's I saw it firsthand in, in your in your center, you know, you've, you're measuring people real time. I think that, that makes Absolutely. a difference. And you wanna know something about that? The, the beauty of that is, okay, I've been in, in, in practice for 26 years. The Pulmonary Wellness Center has been in existence for 20 years, okay? In 20 years, in somewhere around 88,000 exercise sessions, we've had to send about 100 people to the emergency room, okay? It sounds like a lot, but not out of 86,000, right? If you think about it in the gym, that could happen too. 
But the idea is that in 95% of those cases, it was the EKG that told us there was a problem before the patient even had a symptom, right? So if the patient, I don't want to find out you're having a problem by you hitting the deck, right? I want to find out, hey, wait a second, I see something, sit the patient down, let's prevent the problem right? It's like, if you know there's an alligator upstream, then you can change your route. I don't want to find out there's an alligator upstream by getting bit by an alligator. So same type of thing. I don't like surprises. I take my patient's safety extremely seriously. And, you know, that's why, like, when I hear of people who are doing, um, you know, these, these exercises or doing rehab, you know, if a patient's exercising at home, they're probably going to self-limit. OK, what I mean by that is, you know what, they're going to err on the side of being a little overcautious anyway, because they're afraid. But in a rehab center, you know, the patient's not necessarily going to self-limit because they feel confident because the rehab team is there. But if the rehab team is there, I feel they owe it to the patient to have the maximum information that's going to keep them safe. And that's why, you know, with some of these programs where people, I, I do think people can exercise on their own. I do think people can exercise in a gym. I know some people are starting up some of these online pulmonary rehabs, as they call them. I think they're okay. I just think you have to be very, very careful and make sure that you are screened first. Okay. There's a question from Carlos. Caroline, so should you Carolyn, should you see a cardio? Yeah, you need to check this out, okay? I'm not going online and, and signing up for something with people I don't really, you know, how do you know them, you know, I, I, that I know from Facebook without going to my doctors and say, is this gonna be safe for me? Because here's the thing, a lot of times also people get confused. So between your neck and your belly, okay, there's a lot of systems, okay? There's the cardiovascular system, there's the respiratory system, there's the GI system. The thing is that a lot of times the symptoms are very, very similar, okay? And the symptoms of IPF or COPD or asthma or pulmonary hypertension can be very similar at times to the symptoms of coronary artery disease or heart attack or acid reflux, right? But we have to know. I can't say, well, you know, it's probably gas, let me take a Tums, okay? I need to know that my patient's safe. So any question about that, I will refer back to their physician and I'll say, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I, you know, this is what I, what can we do? Let's check it out and make sure. I don't want to assume it's something. And then the other thing is that it's important to never lose sight of the fact that you have a whole person because a lot of times when you get diagnosed with something like COPD or pulmonary fibrosis, that becomes your name, okay? That becomes your name. You become pulmonary fibrosis to your healthcare team, okay? And the problem with that is that just because you have IPF, does not mean that you don't also have a heart problem. Now, I'm not saying this to say, I don't want people at home going like, oh, great, now I have something else to worry about. I'm saying, let's make sure you're gonna be safe because the last thing we wanna do is have you start out on a program to get healthy and roll the dice with your health and your safety. Yeah, and it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really good point that you make around the, the cardiac issues that you're more worried about when you are doing pulmonary rehab. Um, so there's a question from Debbie. Um, She's um, she's on oxygen at night. Um, when she gets up and moves around, she drops as low as 70% on three to four liters. How can I get enough exercise to tone and lose weight? Okay, so let's start with this, to lose weight, okay? To lose weight is 75% diet, 25% exercise. So no, I say to people all the time, um, you can out eat any exercise we give you. OK, so that's diet. And for any patient with a respiratory disease, OK, there's a lot of misinformation about diet. For any patient with respiratory disease, whether it's IPF or COPD, OK, low carbs is the key to success because the, the byproduct of carbohydrate metabolism is carbon dioxide. And the message that carbon dioxide sends to your body and your brain is breathe, 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 breathe. But you already have enough signals saying that, right? So you don't want to have a meal that's going to increase your need to breathe, okay? The other thing is that there's a mechanical issue with eating. And, and you know, with, with IPF patients in particular or interstitial patients, when people start to lose weight, as they often do, okay, the work of breathing is so great that people have a hard time 
maintaining weight and often they lose weight, okay? And the reason for that is twofold. We go back to supply and demand. So they're burning more calories because they're so active metabolically because of their respirations, okay? But the other thing about it is that because of the mechanical impact of food, so when you eat too much, okay, there's increased resistance to diaphragmatic excursion, meaning that basically your diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle that sits here, underneath it is our gastric contents, and the more we eat, the harder the diaphragm has to work to take that breath. So a lot of times people will say, you know, I don't understand what happened. I walked to the restaurant, I was fine. Then I had, you know, shrimp cocktail and fried calamari and chicken parmesan and I had a few drinks and I couldn't walk a half a block home, I had to take a taxi. So that's the mechanics of breathing. It's also the chemistry of breathing, meaning that you're building up that CO2. And you know, again, the, then there's more mechanics of it, which is that the harder you work to breathe, the harder it is to breathe because you get more air trapping and more airway narrowing and more bronchospasm. And that's not just COPD patients. That has to do with everybody, okay? It's the nature of mechanics. So the idea is you have to get on a good eating plan and that includes you know, high quality protein, even healthy fats, but low carbs, okay? But how do you get moving, okay? You're saying that you reach 70% at, on four liters, right? So you need a lot more oxygen. So the, the, the question is, so alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a little bit different than IPF, but the, the situation is the same. You have to bump up the oxygen. So what does that mean? How, how do you do it? You can increase the liter flow, okay? And this brings us to another topic that's very important for respiratory patients, which is the idea of the portable concentrator, right? This is another crazy thing in healthcare, okay? Everybody thinks that these numbers are liter flows, right? So they say, oh, my, my, my portable oxygen concentrator goes up to five liters. I use two liters at rehab and I have this concentrator, it goes up to five liters. What they don't realize is that those numbers are not liters per minute. Their settings, okay? And if you look at how much oxygen is coming out with each breath, it's so little oxygen. So if you need six liters per minute at rehab, there's not a portable oxygen concentrator that's gonna do the trick for you. So then we really have to look at tanks. Then we have to look at going to something other than a cannula like a mask, okay? I have an IPF patient who's, on, who's waiting for transplant right now. She walks around with a cart with six E-tanks because she has to... I mean, this is the toughest lady I know. I mean, and I we did a walk together a couple, a couple of years ago and she's tough. I pushed her cart for part of the walk and it is heavy even for me. But the idea is that when it comes to oxygen saturation, it's kind of like all or nothing. It's like pregnancy. It's like you're either saturated or you're not saturated. So if you're saying that you're using four liters and you're going to 70%, that is by far adequate, not adequate for you, okay? So you have to, first thing is turn up the leader flow. And another thing is, you know, a lot of times people have this idea, their doctors will say four liters per minute or their respiratory therapist will say, use it on three liters per minute, but they never do any real real life testing on the patient. So these are kind of like arbitrary numbers or they become kind of like the default check-in on the computer, but another giant of medicine, Dr. Norma Braun, okay? described it in the best way that I heard it, okay, described. That makes no sense, right? If you are in a room and the room gets chilly, you put your sweater on, right? But if the room, you know, gets warm again, you can take your sweater off. So what I say to patients all the time is rely on your instruments, okay? It's like being a pilot. That's why a pilot needs all these equipment because what you see is not actually how things are. That's why scuba divers have to require rely on depth gauges because you can't tell how deep you are, right? Water is water. Once you're under a certain amount of water, you don't know if you're at 50 feet or 500 feet. Same thing with oxygen saturation. People have this idea that they can tell what their heart rate is and they can tell what their oxygen saturation is. That's a nice carnival trick, but most people can't. And I wouldn't rely on how you feel, okay? So rely on your instruments. And if your saturation is below 90%, you know you need to up that oxygen. So how do you up the oxygen? First thing is you could up the liter flow. Now, once you get up past six liters, okay, the cannula is not doing the trick anymore. So six liters means this cup is full. Anything I pour in over that winds up on the table. 
wasted, goes into the atmosphere, and it's going to be very drying and irritating to your nasal passages and your airways, right? So then you have to go to a different kind of, of thing. And the mask is very effective. So we use non-rebreather masks. And you can you also use a Venturi mask. A lot of people use a Venturi mask. I prefer the non-rebreather mask. I don't know why. I feel more comfortable with it. I get better results with it. But by doing this, and having that reservoir bag, that significantly increases the concentration of oxygen, okay? So I would suggest try to go up to six liters on your cannula. If that does not keep you saturated, then you have to get a, not a higher flow system, but you have to get a mask, okay? And then try that mask on that same lower flow and you, and you, even no matter what the leader flow, you're still going to get a higher concentration by using a mask as compared to a cannula and then start off little by little by little. That's how you do it. Okay. And a lot, but a lot of really how you do it. That's really how you do it. And you know, it, it is in the book. I mean, and it, it, it's, I talk about these things all the time because there's so much misinformation out there, you know, and, and again, you're either saturated or you're not saturated. And you know, again, sometimes it's more trouble for people to carry around this device. Um, and, you know, it sometimes it's not worth it if they're not going to stay saturated, right? It's like that first step is a, you can see I have mayhem going on behind me. Here. <laughs> um, but it's like, it's like, and and ninety percent is a really important thing. And a lot of times, pa patients ask the question, you know, I go down to seventy, but I come up within a minute when I sit down. But what you have to realize is that when your saturation is that low, there's a lot of adaptations and a lot of risk to your body. So there's increased risk, is increased risk of coronary ischemia, meaning that your heart's not getting enough blood flow. Increased risk of arrhythmia, increased risk of myocardial infarction and heart attack and heart failure. And when your oxygen saturation is low, it increases the pressures in the pulmonary artery, okay, and on the right side of the heart. And the right side of the heart is not meant for those high pressures. So you have to be saturated well. It, you mentioned about instrumentation is key, and I, I know, you, you know, you've got the leading, uh, you know, kind of wellness center and you measure you know so many different parameters for people exercising at home other than uh, an oximeter what what should they be looking at you know while they're uh, while they're exercising well you know one of the things you know even and, and you know i anyone who knows me will vouch for this okay and i'm not just trying to make you feel good but i don't get involved with a lot of people okay i don't get involved with everybody who asked me to okay when you came in and talked to me about your product i i liked it and this is not like a plug you didn't you know i'm not here i'm not getting paid um, you know, and I'm not saying it just to, 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 to rank your system, but anything saturation, okay, um, is crucial. Heart rate is crucial. It's very difficult for a patient to really get a heart rhythm. Mm. I mean, especially if you have any type of irregular heart rate, like atrial fibrillation or anything like that, you're not really going to get an accurate rhythm. Okay. What I like about your system, if they have like an, uh, the ability to have a, a spirometer, okay, that's going to give you some data. OK, it's going to allow you to track yourself over time. And that's, you know, I, I tell people to keep a, um, you know, I, I tell people to keep a journal, but I'm pretty sure patient and power is kind of like that journal that you need. OK, and, you know, that's why I want to talk to you more about things that we can do to really track this. So the, the, the spirometer is something that I would use on a daily basis to say, where am I today? OK, or I wake up, I'm not feeling so well. It's like a thermometer. OK, I can't feel my head and know that I'm 101.2. That's why I take out my instrument. So if you wake up and you're particularly having difficulty, blow into that spirometer if you have it or a peak flow meter or something like that. OK, and also blood pressure is very important. Mm -hmm. OK, in addition to my rehab work, I also have been an EMT since 2001. And the, the thing is that um People, you know, I always say if I could have only one vital sign to know, it would be it would be systolic blood pressure. And the reason for that is because systolic blood pressure kind of tells you everything. It tells you is the heart pumping strong enough. It tells you is your cardiac output adequate. It's not necessarily going to tell you that, um, you know, it's it's not necessarily going to tell you your ox is your oxygen saturation going to going to be good enough, but it's going to tell you if it's not good enough. So if your systolic blood pressure is okay meaning that it's not too high and it's not too low, that's kind of like a, a, a like a, a kind of comfort zone for me. It's like a, a comfort blanket, you know, and it tells me, uh, okay, 
overall the system is okay. But I would check blood pressure before exercise. I would check it during exercise, although you have to be pretty still. And there is variability, um, you know, from pressure device to pressure device. But, you know, you want to track trends, okay? Just like if I say to you, you know, your uh, blood pressure is 170 over 90. That sounds terrible, right? But maybe 10 minutes ago, it was 220 over 120, in which case 170 over 90 is awesome, right? So it's very important for people to keep resting base resting data, exercise data, and then to track it over time. Like if we know a stock price, we only know if that stock price is good if we know where it was a month ago and if we know where it's going. Yeah, we, yeah, we try to, to integrate to only uh, devices that we feel are, are kind of good medical grade uh, devices. So for blood pressure, we have uh, an A and D. They've, they've kind of done a lot of clinical trials. You know, they're not one that's just kind of sold on Amazon with no clinical data. So I think it's really important that there's some level of accuracy with them. Absolutely. Um, they've, they've passed the relevant FDA uh, tests um, and they've been used in, in clinical evaluations and that, and that doctors will trust. And, you know, we like to, we, we view kind of what we do as providing, you know, the, the instrumentation data with the subjective data. So Absolutely. People, people have the, the numbers to go with the, I don't feel well, or I, or I feel well today. So they, the two of them should correlate. Absolutely. And and bring that information with you and bring those devices to your doctor's office and compare them with the numbers that your doctor is getting. OK, because that's another way to check your system. But I agree with you 100 percent. OK, get that data, track it. Um, you know, and the other thing is that know the numbers. Right. Like a lot of times people say, um, oh, I'm exercising. My, my heart rate went up to 110. So I, they stopped me. I hear this all the time. I was at pulmonary rehab. My heart rate was resting at 100, so they sent me home. And I'm like, uh, why? You know, or they'll say my heart rate went to 110. I say, how old are you? You know, 50. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. So there's a big difference between what your numbers are supposed to be at rest and what your numbers are supposed to be with exercise. So as an example, if your blood pressure were 170 over 80 at rest, that's a problem, right? But if that's your blood pressure during vigorous exercise, that's not a problem. I say to patients, we want your blood pressure to be somewhere between 140 and 180. If your blood pressure doesn't go up with exercise, that's more of a problem to me than your blood pressure going too high because at least if your pressure is going up, it's telling me that your heart is able to meet the demand of the exercise. Hmm. Okay, so we have another question from Tanya. And it's um, She uh, did pulmonary rehab and it definitely helped her out. Joined Weight Watchers and lost 20 pounds. I was able to, and I was able to improve my breathing. But then it ended and winter started. So what can I do at home to keep it up? So it's on the same theme. All right, as good, question, good question. So let's, let's talk about this, okay? So first of all, if, you know, I don't know your diagnosis, okay? So there's, I see questions here from people with IPF and people here with COPD. So let's just say one thing. If you're diagnosed with IPF, I would be more cautious in advising weight loss as a treatment than I would be for somebody with COPD. Why do I say that? Okay. Now, if you're obese, if you're five foot five, 220 pounds, yes, you have to lose weight. Okay. But I like patients with IPF to have a little bit of a reserve. Okay. And what I mean, I'm not talking about a 50 pound reserve that you have to carry around all day, every day, but I'm saying, an ideal weight for somebody who doesn't have IPF for your height, gender, age, et cetera, might be too low for you. Because again, I want to prepare for that rainy day in the event that you have an exacerbation, in the event that there is a change in your disease status, so that you don't cross that line into slippery slope of now I'm losing so much weight and I'm working so hard to breathe and I can't eat it all. Because weight losses correlates very well with mortality. OK, and so it's great that you lost the weight if you're overweight, but don't lose it all. In other words, keep some for a rainy day just in case all of a sudden you can't eat and you can't, you know, you can't. OK, Tanya, four nine and you were one forty five. OK, so at one eighteen. Cool. You're, you're good there. Don't go to one hundred. Don't go to ninety eight, you know, but don't lose it all. So what could you do? OK, rehab ended now. 
She has emphysema, so that's, oh, you do have ILD too, does it say? Emphysema? Yeah, yeah. she does have ILD. So that's, yeah. whammy, so that's tricky. So what that means, having emphysema, was it, which is an obstructive disease, and having, see, I thought that guy was really, really tall. I thought he was like eight feet tall until now. <laughs> I know you're part of the so Now he's, he's just tall. Um, so anyway, like, you know, the idea is that when you have emphysema and interstitial lung disease, you have an obstructive component to your breathing and a restrictive component to your breathing, meaning that you have difficulty with both phases of breathing, with breathing in and breathing out. So what can you do? Now, we have a lot of patients who, you know, we're limited by insurance in a lot of cases, and we have to give a patient a, a program to do at home. Now, again, exercise is like pushing a car uphill. So is a lot of effort, time, energy. Hey, Sharon, I just noticed you're watching. Hi there. Um, it takes a lot to push that car up the hill, right? But as soon as you stop pushing, that car starts rolling back downhill and it rolls back downhill a lot faster than it took you to get up the hill. Now, what are your options? You can exercise at home, okay? You can join a gym, but whatever it is that you do, okay, um, you have to be safe with it. So in other words, when a patient comes to me and they're monitored, like a lot of times people ask me to come to their homes, okay? New York City is like lifestyles of the rich and famous here, okay? I could, I could charge a thousand bucks an hour to go to somebody's home. I don't do it unless I'm gonna go to their home and say, I want you to come to the rehab center. Why? Because even me in their home, without my monitoring equipment, I still wouldn't be able to push people in the same way that I do with my EKG right in front of me, with my blood pressure, with my team around me, and with my emergency you know, setup around me. So even when our patients are doing great on our program and they wanna continue on a gym, I encourage everybody to do it, okay? If you could go to a gym, that's great, a challenge sometimes with people is that a gym doesn't want you bringing oxygen in, okay? I'm pretty sure that's illegal and against the American with Disabilities Act, um, but again, that can be problematic for people or you need so much oxygen that you can't really go to a gym. Um, but the idea is that even if it's me going to the gym with you, without my monitoring equipment, I would still have to back the work off, workout off by at least 25%. That's about what we do. So if you're doing 2.8 and 8 at our center, we may give you 2, 6, and 6 to do at home. It builds in a little bit of a safety net. So next thing, what could you do? I mean, there are certainly exercises you can do, like calisthenics, or we do something called armor size um, that I learned at the University of California, San Diego about 20 three years ago. Um, but I think it's worth people's while to get a piece of exercise equipment at home. And people say, what's the best piece of equipment? My favorite and best piece of equipment is the treadmill. Not everybody has room for it. Not everybody likes it. But very simply, the best piece of equipment is whatever piece of equipment you're going to use. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people who have a, a lot of fancy clothing hangers uh, in the shape of treadmills, bicycles, and elliptical machines, okay? So get a machine, whatever you're gonna do, and since you can't work out as vigorously as, as you will, or as you can at rehab, back it off, okay? But increase the frequency of the workout. So in other words, it's like if, if you, you know, it's like if we wanna fill this up, if you have a smaller cup, you have to make more trips, or you have a smaller basket, you have to make more trips. So if you if you don't have the rehab and you're going to get something that you're going to work out less vigorously, do it daily. And I think you know when you have these types of conditions, whether it be an obstructive disease or a restrictive disease or heart disease or anything like that, daily exercise is the key. Why? Because people don't go from being able to do all this to be able to be doing nothing, right? So if you can walk a mile today, you can walk a mile tomorrow. If you could walk a mile tomorrow, you could walk a mile the next day. But if you can walk a mile today and then they don't walk for four months, that's where the problem comes in. So I'd say anything you could do at home is going to be a plus. I think the combination of flexibility, stretching, strength exercise, there's a lot of stuff that you could do. And it really almost doesn't matter as long as you do something every single day. But just be advised that Again, your body gets good at doing what you ask it to do. So if you drop off the intensity, you're going to decondition a little bit. So a question, so question from, from uh, Susan. Susan uh, uh, failed failed the six-week walk test and jeopardy of being taken off transplant list. How, how can uh, get the meters required in two and a half weeks so don't lose my listing? I'm on 
15 per minute walking. So are you, okay, so are you saying that you didn't, you're saying that you can't walk enough in six minutes? Okay, so here's, I'm assuming you can't walk enough. Now, that's strange to me because, you know, the, 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 one of the sad ironies about lung transplant is this, is that, you know, we want to get you in shape for the transplant, right? But if you're in too good a shape, they won't take you. And if you wait and then you're in too bad a shape, they won't take you. So you say to yourself, like, well, well what are we supposed to do? The idea is you want to condition the rest of your body so that, um, you know, so that you're, you're going to, number one, do well during the transplant and that you're going to, you know, be, do well after the transplant. So the idea about that is how do you get your, your distance up, okay? There's a lot of ways to answer that question. Number one, you have to use the 15 liters per minute, okay? Number Now, now here's another thing. This is, I'm glad you brought this up because I wasn't, I didn't plan to say this, but I'll say it because it's a great thing to say. Um, I didn't plan to say anything we talked about today, by the way, but, um, <laughs> but a lot of times when people need to walk more, okay, the best thing to do, I'm gonna, what I'm about to give you right now is going to be gold, no joke, okay, a rolling walker. OK, as crazy as that sounds, those triangular rollating walkers are a gift from God for the pulmonary patient. OK, why do I say that? And people are like, ah, I'm not going to use a walker. Right. There's a lot of vanity involved in that. Right. Or people will come to me and they'll say, you know what? Um, I can only walk a quarter of a block. And I say to them, no, you can't. You can walk more than that. They say, no, I can't trust me. And I say, yes, you can trust me take this rolling walker and then I take them on the street and we walk all the way around the block. Why is that? Okay. A lot of people don't know why that is. Okay. But it's not just the fact that you have this stability. It's like people say, well, you know, I can walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes, but if I walk to the bathroom, I get short of breath. Holding on it does a tremendous service to your respiratory system. Okay. So the idea is that, um, you know, when I am sitting like this and my arms are moving around in space, we call this open chain activity, okay? So when I'm in an open chain like this, my chest does things like this and this. My shoulders do things like this. My back does things like this. But when you fix the upper extremities, and what I mean by that is when you lean on something, okay, all of the muscles that you use to do those activities, the chest, the back muscles, the serratus muscles in, in, you know, on your thorax, the intercostals, all work in their reverse action to assist with rib cage elevation, okay? So sometimes people come in and they can't walk at all, okay? And I know that they're going to get to being really good walkers at some point, but we need something now to put in the distance, right? It's like when you're trying to train for a fight, you got to put in those miles, okay? But you can't put in those miles because under normal circumstances, you're too short of breath. But use whatever because your body doesn't know you're using a walker, right? Just like your body doesn't know you're using oxygen. So the idea is that by using this walker, by using the oxygen, bumping it up, okay, put in that track and then do more and more and more. And then that's that's one thing that's a huge thing. And you can put your oxygen in there. The other thing is to be clear. I want to make sure that you're using 15 liters with a mask, because if you're using 15 liters with a cannula, then I got news for you. You're not using 15 liters. OK, when I hear that from people, I'm like, boy, you really don't know anything. Uh, look who's there. That's my that's my friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's my two friends. Um, if Because if you're using a cannula for that, then you're not getting anything even close to 15 liters, but the atmosphere is getting all your oxygen. So the thing is, with that, you have to use a, a tank, right? Because there's no portable concentrator that is going to give you that much oxygen, right? There's no, um, you know, and, and also let's just talk for a minute about the difference between continuous and pulse oxygen, right? So... A lot of times, what there's a, a saying, I saw this on a wall of a hardware store. It was a sign that said, everybody wants three things when they do a job. They want it done fast, they want it done well, and they want it done cheap. You could get any two out of the three, right? You could get it done fast and cheap, it's not going to be good. Get it done fast and well, it's not going to be cheap. You get the idea. Same thing with oxygen. 
oxygen, right? Everybody wants a tank that's going to be light, that's going to last a long time, and it's going to give them a high leader flow. You could pick any two out of the three, right? You, because this is not people like, why don't they just invent this? It's like saying, why don't you invent another earth, right? This is all bio, you know, it's biochemistry, but it's also physics. It's like, it's bio, it's, it's not like you just can invent something that's going to put out more because in order to have something that would put out 15 liters per minute in a concentrator, it would have to be gigantic. It's like, remember what the computers used to be. They used to be gigantic. They'd fill a whole room. So the idea is that you get a, one of these walkers that will, number one, allow you to put your oxygen in this thing. Okay. You can put your oxygen in the, the holder of it. You need a tank. You need a mask. You need to then start walking every day, okay? And you need to get out and do it, and you need to be able to change your tanks. Now, here's another thing, strategy, okay? Strategy for the six-minute walk test. And I hate to talk strategy on a, on a test like that because it's like I'm giving you exactly the technique that I'm saying I don't like that test for. But a lot of people will say, well, they say to the therapist, well, you know, um, what should I do? Should I, and the therapist, oh, do whatever you feel comfortable with, or oh, well, so you can run out really fast, okay? Um, and maybe you, you, you get tired, right? And you have to stop. So now you spend a minute and a half, which is a quarter of the time, trying to catch your breath again. Or you could go slow and steady. And what I would suggest to you is try this yourself, set your timer up. See what technique works for you. Try and see what happens if you have to set out fast and then you have to stop and rest. How much time do you get? Okay. Or see what happens if you take it slow and steady. Okay. Because figure out, I mean, in your case, it's a dire situation. You're trying to get a transplant. So the last reason I would want you to not get a transplant is you can't get the right number of meters on a test that is, is so arbitrary anyway, right? So let's at least get you up to the meters. Get the things, um, you know, get the walker, start walking, start trying walking quickly, start trying walking slowly. The other thing about the airways is that when you, as I said before, the harder you try to breathe, the harder it is to breathe. Think of it like we're all in a movie theater and all of a sudden we say, you know what, we need to evacuate the theater, okay? If all of a sudden everybody runs for the wall, for the exit, there's gonna be a big block. I see, you see this at every Broadway show in New York City, people who couldn't care less who they have to trample, oxygen <laughs> and no oxygen, to get out that door, right? But if we all file out orderly, right, we have a nice smooth flow of people out, and it's the same way your airways work, okay? So you can get back to it, okay? If you're on the transplant list, that means that at some point in the recent past, you were a candidate and you were getting the numbers, okay? So unless something went drastically wrong, like you got hit by a car or broke your leg, um, you know, then then you can probably get back to that, at least good enough. But again, I think it's a matter of getting you moving again, checking the leader flow, making sure you're well saturated, using the mask for that, and then using that rolling walker. A couple of questions. I said, what does it do that you do for rib cage elevation? I said that when you fix the upper extremities, meaning that you hold on to something, or like if you lean on something. So a lot of times, if people lean down like this, or if you look over here, like if people, you know, lean like this, they feel better. Or if they lean over on a table, they feel better. That's why when people say, um, you know, I, I, on, in the grocery store, I use my shopping cart and I can walk. It's the same principle with a triangular shaped walker. And Melody, no, I didn't say everyone should use it, but it, the people who should use it are the people who cannot get enough distance to get over the hump. Right. So this is what's going to get you over the hump. It's going to get you moving enough so that you can start to do more vigorous exercise. So it's like it's that's what's going to get us the momentum. Right. Like once the car gets over that hump, it's going to start moving on its own. But that is going to be what gets us there. We, we still, still have quite a lot of uh, questions to get through. I have time. I, you know, and if you want to go over, if you want to go to one, I'm fine with that. I don't know what anyone, what your schedule is like, Eamon, but I, I, I schedule time for this. So I'm happy to keep answering. I'm happy yeah. to keep answering too. Um, so question from Beth. Be by 10 p.m. though. <laughs> no, I'm notorious for like three or four hour webinars. So I'm, I'm happy to go. As long as you want to go, just give me the hook when it's time. 
Let's keep going until we've answered all the questions. So uh, this one's from Beth. Uh, I've had a heart ablation for PSVT for about 10 years. I occasionally have sinus uh, tachycardia. I think I should be wearing a heart monitor during pulmonary rehab. I still get extremely short breath, but O2 sats are still about 95. I have PF. Okay, good question. So for those of you that don't know, PSVT is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. What that means is that there's sort of like a, a an irritable area where all of a sudden it's not in the ventricles because ventricular tachycardia is a lethal arrhythmia, okay? But paroxysmal anything means it comes and it goes. It's not there all the time. So like when people say like, I have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, meaning sometimes you get awoken by by shortness of breath when you sleep, that's what paroxysmal means. So when somebody goes into SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, we usually see a rate of anywhere from 120 to 180, okay? And the thing, what, what an ablation is, is that if they can isolate, they go through what we call electrophysiologic studies, and they take you into a, a, a cath lab or an electrophysiology lab, and they can sort of try to stimulate different areas of the heart electrically to see if they can find that one irritable area or that one irritable focus, as we call it. And if they find it, what they can do is they can ablate it, meaning that they heat it up and they basically it scars over and you no longer have that rhythm. Now, there's a, if we could put that question up again, Eamon, um, just because there's a lot to it and I want to break it down bit by bit. Yeah, um, sure. Just scrolling back to us. So the thing about this is that that heart ablation at this point should no longer be a factor. Now, sometimes people have an, an ablation and it doesn't work because we're talking about microscopic, tiny, tiny areas. OK, so sometimes people have an ablation for AFib or, or a cardioversion for AFib and then it comes back. It sounds like your PSVT is gone. OK, because SVT is a little bit different than sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia, sinus means it's coming from the SA node, which is the normal pacemaker of the heart, okay? So the normal pacemaker of the heart can beat fast and it can beat slow. So you can have sinus tachycardia or you can have tachycardia for another reason. So if I have 10 cups of coffee and my heart rate is above 100 because of that, that's sinus tachycardia. In other words, it's going through the normal electrical waves and places but it's just fast, okay? So you think you should be wearing a heart monitor. Again, as I said, I want people to, um, I like everyone to wear a heart monitor. I don't wanna guess what your heart is doing, but if the pulmonary rehab doesn't have heart monitors and they don't have access to it, you know, what can you do about that? I mean, a lot of places simply don't have it. And that's where I said, you know, the, 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 the pulse oximeter may tell you when you're in sinus tack and there's not necessarily hey she always picks the loudest toy possible <laughs> um but anyway like the idea is that sinus tack during exercise might be normal okay so in other words if you're exercising vigorously a heart rate of 120 depending upon your age is not unusual okay so the question is why is your heart rate going high so it could be because you have pulmonary fibrosis, and in addition to the exercise, you're working harder than somebody without pulmonary fibrosis might, okay? Um, so that could also raise your heart rate. Um, and then you, you bring up something also. You say you get extremely short of breath, but your O2 sats are still about 95. So that's another important factor to, to, to consider. Many people are very short of breath, but their saturation is good. Many people's saturation is terrible, and they don't feel as short of breath. And that's where, again, it's crucial to rely on your instrument. So a lot of times, you know, if, if I were to like poke your eye, like come near your eye and just keep poking, 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 you'd find that really annoying, but eventually over time you'd get used to it and you'd be immune to it. That's how low saturations can be for some people. And particularly with the pulmonary fibrosis community, a lot of times you, you look at somebody and you say, are you okay? And they say, yeah, I'm okay, but their saturation is 80%, right? But just because they don't feel particularly dyspneic at that moment does not mean that they're really okay and that they shouldn't be saturated or that they shouldn't be oxygenated. So 
right here, as far as like, should you be wearing a heart monitor? The fact that you're in in sinus tack doesn't necessarily mean you should be wearing a heart monitor more than anybody else. So if I go with the caveat that I want everybody to wear a heart monitor, then it would be yes. But sinus tack is not anything that I say, oh no, she's in sinus tack. It just means you have a fast heart rate. Just as far as rate, a lot of times people will get slowed down by their rehab team because they're, again, I feel a lot of times it's it's because the rehab team is, is nervous. Um, and again, don't get the idea that I'm a renegade. I'm not. Safety is number one. I, I am really, it's my number one priority. But the idea is that you, you know, being 110 with exercise is not the same as being 110 at, at rest. Being 120 with exercise is not the same as being 120 at rest. As a general rule, all things being equal, which things are never equal, but we will let our patients go up to about 200 minus their age at peak exercise. Not that we're shooting for that, but that's where we sort of say, okay, we need to cut it back a little bit. So a few more questions uh, just to get through here. So from Astrid, how low can your oxygen go during exercise? I suppose that's going to vary to me, quite a lot. In the 90s. To me, I want to keep it in the 90s, okay? There's, you know, I don't say that with exercise it's okay to 85% because don't forget there's also, hey, don't forget there's also going to be other factors there that, you know, the, the, the demand is going to go way up. So that's not the time where I'm going to say, oh, the demand is up. Okay, well, you know, you don't have to wear your seatbelt for this one. You know, it's like, well, you know, we're at 95 anyway. That's the time you need your seatbelt. So that's the time that you, you know, you really need to, to, to be oxygenated well more than at any other time. And then this question is debated over and over again. Can you get too much oxygen? I don't believe, look. Here's, a, here's where people get crazy, okay? I have mayhem going on behind me here. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> That's all right. If it continues. If you have trouble hearing me, let me know, and I'll, I'll get them in the other room. But, but um, So here's the thing. There are people who are what we call CO2 retainers, okay? Carbon dioxide retainers, okay? And under normal circumstances, your body responds to three major stimuli for respiration. So the, the respiratory center is in the medulla of the brainstem, and it basically is gonna respond to rises in carbon dioxide, drops in oxygen, and increased acidity or increased hydrogen ion in the bloodstream, okay? Now, there are people with obstructive diseases like COPD, emphysema, who are CO2 retainers, meaning that their CO2 is chronically high. And if we take away that stimulus for respiration, a lot of people believe that if you oxygenate them, that you then take away their complete stimulus for breathing and they stop breathing. Every time we talk about this, there's, there's people who will say, you know what, I had too much oxygen and I wound up unconscious in the ICU. So I'm not going to say that there's nobody who could have too much oxygen, okay? I would never say that. I would say you have to ask your doctor. But in more than 15 years in EMS and more than 25 years in cardiopulmonary rehab, I've never, ever once seen anybody get in trouble for having too much oxygen. But I've seen a lot of people get in trouble for not having enough oxygen, okay? And my feeling is that if you're giving somebody 100% oxygen and they're still in trouble, then they were probably going to be in trouble no matter what you did, and it's not because of the oxygen. Now, again... This is my opinion. I feel like in the hundreds of thousands of times I've seen patients, you know, I would have at least seen it one time. Okay, I think during sleep, it's a much bigger issue. And I think there you have to be particularly careful. But again, I'm speaking mainly to the obstructive diseases. When you have pulmonary fibrosis, almost nobody with pulmonary fibrosis is a CO2 retainer. In fact, quite the opposite, okay? Because with COPD, the lungs don't deflate, so you never really clear that CO2, okay? But in, in, in IPF, you have difficulty inflating and no trouble deflating. So my feeling is no, you an IPF patient cannot get too much oxygen. And again, whatever damage you think you're going to do by having too much oxygen is, is far outweighed by not having enough oxygen. So I feel like, you know... No, you should be using as much oxygen as you sh as you need and with as high a flow thing as you need, like a mask, to remain saturated in the 90s. You use a mask when the flow is high. Yep, yep. That's, the, that's your best opportunity. 
Is it better um, to live in a dry climate or humid climate with IPF? We're moving from California to Florida. You know, this is something that, um, you know, you hear all the time and there's, there's differences from people to people, you know, there, there's differences between people. Um, for me, I feel like, you know, there are people who, with particularly the COPD patients who do well in dry, warm air. Um, and there, there are people with IPF who, you know, do benefit from some increased humidity. Um, but with that increased humidity, you get a little bit more work of breathing because the air is a little bit thicker. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that, um, you know, the body gets used to what you do. It The body doesn't like change very much. The body likes what we call homeostasis. So my feeling is if you lived in a cold climate, eventually um, you'd get used to it. You would not believe what's going on here. Um, but eventually you'd get used to it. My dog is now opening and closing the shades. Hey, everybody relax. Um, and also, like, if you lived in a hot, humid climate, you'd eventually get get used to that, too. In New York City right now, over the last couple of years, I notice a lot of people are having trouble because our weather's crazy. So like one day it'll be 60 and humid, and the next day it'll be 20. And that really messes with people's systems. I mean, if you're moving, I would say if you're already moving from California to Florida, you've made your choice. You're going to deal with it. But, you know, you'll be okay. I mean, you'll be okay. He may have some difficulty at the beginning. He's going to get used to it. Whatever whatever the climate is there, his respiratory will adapt. Now, that may mean at the beginning he needs more support. So if he uses oxygen, turn up the oxygen. Again, rely on your instruments. You know, I always think of these things as like we're two lumberjacks and we're carrying a log, right? So it's like prednisone. Prednisone is like two lumberjacks carrying a log. Initially, the prednisone is doing all the work. So you have to let that prednisone do the work. And as you withdraw it, I'm getting more and more of the log. So Kathy, when you move down there, I would say it might be more difficult to breathe. It might be easier to breathe. I don't know because everybody's different. And sometimes logic doesn't come into the equation. Okay. Sometimes it just is what it is. And whatever I think, someone will, will tell me something different. So I would say this, do what it takes to Support yourself as that gets, you know, as you first get down there. So if it means using more oxygen to decrease the work of breathing, so be it. If it means cutting the workouts back a little bit, so be it, okay? But little by little, like anything else, that is like an increased workload on your respiratory system, and you should adapt to it. If you can't adapt to it, that's a problem. But I it, I think between California and Florida, I know there can be very big variations, but do what you need to do to support that change, especially at the beginning. So Melanie, for, for, yeah, I just want to say, even if you're a retainer, you can't get too much oxygen. Again, there are people who say, you know, yes, you 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 can. If you're a CO2 retainer, I would say that maybe you can get too much oxygen. Again, I've never seen it happen. I've never seen it happen. It, you know, I know people who will, will say to me, yes, I'm irresponsible. I'm giving people bad advice. I'm telling them something that could be very, very dangerous to them. If there's one person who gets in trouble for, for too much oxygen out of a thousand, that would that would be about the numbers I've seen it in. So uh, again, I'm not saying if you're a CO2 retainer, don't don't go low or use more. I'm not saying anybody should do anything. I'm saying ask your doctor. Whatever your doctor says, that's what you say. I don't know you, okay? And even if I did know you and I evaluate you and I'm not sure about something, I'm going to ask your doctor, okay? I'm going to make sure. I don't like to say, yes, this is a blanket statement. There's no blanket statement that applies to everybody. Anything you do, you must ask your doctor. Susan, you're on 15 to 18 with exertion. Should you be using the non- No, not necessarily. Rely on your instruments. If you can stay saturated on a cannula, then, then by all means do it. So next one from Bill. Um, so it's a bit like the access to, to pulmonary rehab that we've talked about. So what can he do? So, you know, more about what he can do at home. I think you got to get moving. I think you have to, you know, you could start out with a walking program. You can, you know, and again, you can always start like you, you can't do too little exercise really at the beginning. You can only do too much. Right. So I would say this. Let's use as an example walking. But it could also equally be biking. It could be new step. It could be any exercise that you're going to do. Don't think short term, right? So don't think like in one month, I want to be able to do a mile. No, think in the next year. Like, so if you were to do 
one minute of exercise today, right? Everybody could probably do a minute of exercise, right? Even if that exercise is lifting this pen up and down, if I do that for a minute, but I, we're gonna say walking, if I go out and walk for one minute today and I add one minute per day, in a month, I'm gonna be walking for 30 minutes. In two months, I'm gonna be walking for an hour, okay? How do you change the intensity of, of or how do you change the, the the parameters of exercise. You could change the frequency, so you can increase the number of times. You could change the intensity by working out harder. You can change the time by working out longer, and you can work out, you know, you can change the exercise. But if you have nothing you can do, I would say start out slow. Start out with something that you know you can do. And don't walk out five blocks if you live on a country road and then realize, hey, I can't walk back. Walk out a half block, come back a half block. Once you know you can do that, do it again. Walk out a half block, come back a half block. But anything you're going to do, start slow, add things gradually, a little bit at a time, and think long term. And that's very much the, the theme of the, the, the ILFA in Ireland, the 2,000 steps a day challenge. It's about gradually building up your steps. It's exactly Absolutely. along the theme you're talking Absolutely. about. Because you know what? The people that get out too fast – it's like um, eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to backfire. You know what I mean? I, I think long term. I don't want – and a lot of times people come in their first or second workout. They are like, that's it? And I'm like, yeah, trust me on this. The last thing I want is in your first workout for you to call me and say, hey, you know what? I couldn't move for two days after that workout. No, because it's not just your breathing. It's your muscles that have to get used to it. And even more than your muscles, your muscles grow fast and get strong fast, okay? But it's your ligaments, your tendons, your joints. Those things take much, much longer to develop their strength. And so it doesn't do you any good if you have six strong weeks and then you tear a ligament or pull it, you know, doesn't make sense. So think long term. Think about something that you could do over the long haul that's going to be safe um, and that's not going to injure you or, or make you sick. So next question there from Linda. Sometimes I feel out of breath or feel funny, so I check my oxygen and it's 98 or 99. I think you talked about this already a little bit earlier, that, that sometimes that the two don't, aren't necessarily correlated. And she also adds, by the way, I do have IPF and emphysema um, and I've had NSCLC stage three. I'm three years in remission. Okay, so, so great. So what we're talking about, so as I say, you know, over and over again, breathing is multifactorial. So there are many systems that are involved in breathing. It could be your respiratory system. It could be your pulmonary, uh, I mean, it could be your cardiovascular system. It could be that you're out of shape. It could be that you've gained weight. It could be that you stopped taking the stairs and you've deconditioned. Um, so the good news about this is that you feel like you're short of breath, but your oxygen is 98 or, or 99. So that's much better than being short of breath and your oxygen is 80%, right? So we know it's not a saturation issue. So maybe it's a mechanical issue. So you said you have IPF and emphysema, is that correct? Correct, yes. So you have emphysema, okay? Emphysema is an, obstruct, uh, an obstructive disease, which means you have difficulty, um, you know, exhaling. And IPF is in, in a restrictive disease, which means you have difficulty breathing in so that's a double whammy that can make you short of breath and you had non-small cell carcinoma um so the question with that would be well what was your treatment did you have surgery did you have radiation did you have chemotherapy because radiation and chemo can also um contribute to pulmonary fibrosis okay in some ways the other thing is that and this is a good point i'm glad you brought, brought it up you know, when people have lung cancer, I see a trend that, um, you know, I see these patients very late, oftentimes after surgery. So, you know, a lot of times surgeons have this idea that, well, you know, we got the cancer out, therefore you're fixed, right? So patients are not short of breath right after surgery because everything's fresh and new. And if you think about when you cut yourself, right, that's not when your limitation comes. Your limitation comes as you heal and as you scar down. Same thing with the lungs, okay? There's a lot of redundancy in the lungs, and the lungs will fill out the space where the tissue has been cut out. But what I want people to do, I want to see people two weeks after surgery. A lot of times what happens is people go out and they're just told, you know, you don't have to do anything special or just walk and they're not short of breath, 
But over the next six to 12 weeks, as they start to heal, they get more and more short of breath. And why is that? It's because they've had surgery. They're not taking a deep breath on that side. They're protecting this. Okay. They're, um, you know, not taking that deep breath and they're not feeling well. So they don't see that limitation. But now as they start to heal, they want to do more and more. And now that tight lung is giving them a problem. Okay. So you're in remission. That I don't believe is an issue anymore. I see you said you had proton therapy and chemo. Um, so, you know, again, whether that's an issue or not is neither here nor there. Your saturation is, is, is great. So it's not a saturation issue, right? It could be a conditioning issue. It could be a mechanics issue. The treatment in that case is the same, okay? Start getting moving again. Learn some of the breathing techniques, the paced breathing, the pursed lip breathing. And a lot of times people say, well, pursed lip breathing, that doesn't work for IPF, or that doesn't work for C, that, that's only for COPD. Everything I say is for everybody, okay? So, and when I say that, I mean, it might be for everybody, and it might not be for anybody, okay? So in my book, I, I have this chart, and you don't even need to open my book to do this. You can make the chart. On one side, just draw a line down the paper and put one to 10 on each side. One side is in, one side is out. And try the different combinations that are good for you. So we tell people to breathe in through your nose for a count of two and blow out for a count of four. That's the basic. You have to have it, you know, uh, you have to draw the initial ink stroke at one point, and that's a good starting point. But if that's not comfortable for you, maybe it's two and five, maybe it's two and six, maybe it's three and seven. So try all these different combinations to see what works for you. The only thing that's not going to be good, and this is a particular challenge for people with IPF and interstitial lung disease, is getting a long enough inhale, right? Because breathing in with IPF is like when Jack LaLanne used to blow up that hot water bottle. There's a lot of resistance to that inhalation. But the problem is if you're only breathing in for one, okay, from here to here is your windpipe, your trachea, you have a ridge here, and that's where it goes to right and left bronchi. In here, this is a conducting zone. No air here can get into the blood bloodstream. So that means no oxygen that's here is, is useful. So what that means is that if you're breathing in for one or going, <laughs> that air is just going in and out of the windpipe and none of it gets into your blood. So you don't get the benefit, um, you know, you don't get the benefit of the oxygen. So it's really important to try to work on at least getting a breath in for two so you can get that air past the conducting zone. It's really called anatomical dead space, we call it, because it's useless to you, okay? So that's why you have to slow your breathing down, try to get that deep, you know, people with IPF don't usually have trouble with exhalation. People with COPD often have trouble with exhalation and air trapping. So that's where that you know, that theater thing comes in where you have to just try to get the air to come out nice and orderly and not try to shove right out. But, with, you know, the key is trying to just talk to yourself, say, I know what to do here. But it, it's great that your oxygen's high. So that means that's one less thing to worry about. Um, um, Mary, we've covered your question. Uh, what do you think? Uh, harmonic uh, exercise uh, alone, uh, so uh, no uh, cover. Uh, he thinks it's a very good complementary thing. Uh, but shouldn't be used in isolation. Should be kind of using some frontline therapy as well. Um, Cheryl, uh, could the combination of anti-rejection meds and chemo raise a person's blood sugar? Um, I don't know, and I don't, I don't think that I, I don't know the answer to that. I think you should ask your yeah ask your transplant team. Yeah, if you're uh, on prednisone, that could definitely raise your blood sugar. So if prednisone is one of them, then the answer is yes. But I'm not an expert on anti-rejection medication. Sharon, how you doing? Still having extreme bloat, making it hard to exercise, any remedy, making ginger tea, beano, and watching diet, change probiotics. Okay, so so this is this is a problem. So, you know, this is one thing that I talk about, and I, I alluded to it before when we talked about, you know, the nutrition stuff. So your body doesn't care if the space is being taken up by liquid, solid, or gas. So meaning like if you're full of drink or if you're full of food um, or if you're gassy and bloated, okay? Any one of those things in the abdominal cavity is going to be restricted the excursion of the diaphragm. So we've spoken about this, okay? I, I hope you're doing better on the VSL3, which is, in my opinion, the best um, probiotic. Um, 
I would say this, Sharon, you have to see a gastroenterologist. I mean, you've tried the basics. You know, I'm all for home remedies. I'm all for over-the-counter types of things. But if you've tried something, you know, and, and now so many medications that before were prescription medications are available over the counter. And I, I think they get abused in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, I'm all for trying Prilosec for two weeks if you have reflux. But guess what? If it's been months or really weeks and your symptoms are not getting any better or they're getting worse or it's been a really long time, you need to see a specialist because then you need something stronger than just you know, probiotics or something like that. And there may, you know, this may be telling you that there's really something significant going on that, that needs treatment. So, you know, I, I've given you like, yeah, ginger tea does work for some people. Beano works for some people. Watching your diet, probiotics, those would be all the things I would say, you know what, try it out. And for some people, that's enough. Any one of those things might be enough to say, hey, you know what, my bloat is gone. But if it's been this much time, Sharon, I would strongly urge you to see a gastroenterologist and particularly one who's, you know, got a lot of experience with irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel disease, um, ulcerative colitis, uh, Crohn's, diverticulitis. And I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that I think you have any of those things, but I think it's way past the scope of, you know, the Internet doctor at this point. Okay, so question from uh, Patricia. My oxygen dropped to 40 while walking the treadmill at rehab. The nurse reassigned me to arm machine. My specialist didn't seem concerned, said it wasn't that low. Is he right? I'm not on oxygen. Uh, I was going to say if your specialist didn't seem concerned, then he's not really a specialist. <laughs> um, but, but again, I don't think your oxygen dropped to 40. In my opinion, what probably happened was that um, – you probably were not getting a good saturation. You weren't getting a good reading. Um, you know, one of the things that could happen on the treadmill is because you're gripping very hard, you don't get good blood flow to the fingers, or if your fingers are cold, or if you have very thin fingers. Um, another thing that can happen sometimes is, you know, your body's always going to perfuse the main organs first. Like the brain is smart. The brain's always going to make the make sure the brain gets enough oxygen before the fingers get enough oxygen. The heart is caring. It's going to make sure itself gets enough oxygen before the fingers get enough oxygen. I definitely don't think your oxygen saturation was 40%, okay, because if that were the case, trust me, they would be concerned. You wouldn't because you'd probably be lying on the floor unconscious. Um, but the idea is that I wouldn't change the arm machine. Why would you do that, right? Because if it's really not 40, you need the benefit of the treadmill. But I would say, can we get a forehead sensor so that I'm going to get an accurate reading? Like you need to get an accurate reading when you're at rehab. Like if you say, well, my plane only measures altitude up to 10,000 feet. Well, that's a problem because at 10,001, we don't know if we're at 10,001 or 50,000. I know you weren't at 40. OK, so you could stop saying you dropped to 40. You didn't because you'd be in real trouble with that. Um, but why should you be deprived of the treadmill and the exercise just because the equipment is not getting an accurate reading on you? So I would say first try hand warmers. OK, those things that you just open up, they get hot and you could hold those in your hands before you get a reading. That helps a lot. If not, get a forehead sensor because that is almost always some people you have to, you can only get a reading on that. And again, if you're, you know, look, not everybody at home has to go out and get a thousand dollar machine or a $3,000 machine. But guess what? If you're a pilot and you're responsible for flying this plane, you better have the right equipment. Okay. You're not the home hobbyist flying a toy, a toy plane. Okay. Same thing with the rehabs. They got to have the right equipment. It can't be like, well, maybe you're okay, maybe you're not okay. So first thing is get those hand warmers, okay? Second thing is if that doesn't work, forehead sensor. And the other thing is, you know, people ask me what what oximeter I like. For 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 80 to 90% of the people, they'll be fine with any oximeter, okay? But there are certain people, and even I want to try out your oximeter with some of my tougher people, um, but we've had the most success with a company called Massimo. And I, I don't mean to advertise another brand on your on your show even, but but there are certain people who those are the only oximeters we could get a reading with. They they work on a slightly different technology than every other oximeter. 
Um, so, you know, we have them and we use them and, and, you know, they're specifically for neonates or people with poor perfusion. Um, and we get, we get that information from them, but, you know, Eamon, let me try out, I'll, I'm happy to try out your system and, you know, we see, see how those things go. Um, but you weren't at 40, don't worry about that. But again, you should make sure that you, they are getting the accurate readings on you so that you could get the best workout. You know, a lot of times people, here's another concept nobody talks about, right? Everybody wants more rehab sessions, right? Everybody wants more rehab sessions. So the idea is I want people to get the right rehab sessions, okay? Meaning like, yeah, you want more cups of beer, right? So you could have more cups of beer, but if they only have this much beer in it, what difference does it make how many cups you I want a nice full cup of beer right? I want a nice full rehab center. That's why we, I mean, rehab session. That's why we monitor people minute by minute by minute. So that if we see a change now and we have to slow somebody down now, then we can do it. Okay. But if we can bring somebody up now and get more out of it, why not do it? It's like, if you're a gold rush guy and all of a sudden you find an area where you say, oh, there's a lot of gold here. We're going to start trying to maximize that gold. We're not going to go at the same pace. So that's the idea behind getting the most out of each and every session. And that's the idea behind, you know, it's like we don't want it too hot. and We don't want it too cold. We want, we like our porridge just right. We want the right rehab session for you. Quality over quality. Absolutely. So that was so a question, question for uh, my knuckles. Is, is, is that, that low O2? O2? So it could be low O2. Um, but the question is, is it, is it a peripheral low O2 or is it central O2? So in other words, is it just that you're not getting, you know, uh, you know, that you're just not getting good circulation to your fingers because of what I just said, your body's sucking it in, you know, to your heart and your brain and it's decreasing in the periphery. That's not as significant as if like your, your, your lips are also blue and your tongue is blue or things like that. But again, I wouldn't want to say, I would want to check your saturation. Okay. And because they're blue, that makes me think, well, maybe we're not going to get perfect circulation to your finger. And so we might not get a perfectly accurate, um, you know, reading, but I would say, you know, it, it doesn't really matter if your fingers are, are blue, if your saturation is good, um, unless you're like in the wilderness and you're, you know, you're getting bluer by the minute, but it's, it's not necessarily a, a sign that your overall oxygen saturation is low. It could be a sign that there's been a redistribution of blood flow. I know from uh, looking at some of your other webinars and, and reading some of your material that you talk about, um, you know, it's part diet, part exercise, part your medical team. Absolutely. Um, so there's a question here, a few questions around from uh, Rhonda. Is there anything that would help my immune system stronger? So I know you talk as well about helping prevent uh, infection risk. And there was also a couple of questions around uh, what's your thoughts on using, um, you know, uh, masks to help prevent infection. Perfect. Perfect. So, so for me, the idea of ultimate pulmonary wellness, which is, you know, my concept of I think there's five things that over time I feel are the big ones okay not to say there's not a million things you could say that are going to improve your health but I found that there are five things that make a bigger difference than anything else okay and they're all about 20 percent each number one is medical okay so medical means having the right doctor taking the right medications taking the medications properly now in our society now every every everybody's different but for example um like in the u.s we're 80 percent medical right so we're 80 percent medical and at the end of the treatment your doctor may say and, and i don't want to generalize so don't call me doctors and tell me this i work with great doctors okay so i work with real good people but you know unfortunately a lot of it is here's your medications okay oh by the way try to get a little more exercise no it's not like that because it's what you do every day that you get good at doing. So it's 20% having the right doctor and medical team, taking the right medications, taking the medications properly. 20% is exercise. 20% is nutrition. And nutrition means being the right weight, not overeating, you know, carbohydrates, um, but eating for your disease. And there's very, very few people who really know about pulmonary nutrition. They give you like these basic um, cardiovascular, you know, nutrition from the eighties and, you know, people with pulmonary disease are eating these high carb, high sugar drinks. 
and that's making it more difficult for them to breathe. Um, the other thing is stress management and meditation because it's very stressful not being able to breathe and we're getting this constant sympathetic fight or flight outflow, which is also very damaging to our bodies. Um, and then prevention of infection, okay? So there's two things here. There's one, how do you strengthen your immune system, okay? Strengthening your immune system has to do with all of these things, okay? So for all these things that you do are gonna improve your overall strength and, and immunity. Um, and then prevention of infection. So this is where Scott, so Scott, you are wearing like 400 Mardi Gras beads in that picture, okay? So I'll tell you what would be less of a waste of time is don't count on the drunken college girl on top of the float to throw some beads at you that you're then gonna pick up off the floor of Bourbon Street and put around your neck, okay? That's how you get sick, okay? But here's how you prevent inf infection, okay? Number one, frequent hand washing, okay? How do you get sick? Most people get sick by touching something that has been infected by a bacteria or a virus, and they introduce it to their body through their mucous membranes, right? So your mucous membranes, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. So you're standing on the subway, right? Or on Bourbon Street, right? Where 500 people have touched those beads, you grab the beads, put them around your neck, and then guess what? Oh wait, my eye is itchy. Wait, let me blow my nose. Let me, you know, do something like this. Let me pick my teeth. You just got whatever everybody who touched those beads got. So number one, frequent hand washing. You can't always wash your hands though, okay? So that means carrying around an antibacterial cream lotion that you could put on anytime you come in contact with anything that you don't know. Public places, a desk at the library, okay? You don't know if Typhoid Mary was reading War and Peace right before you were there. And now you're sitting there and you're breathing in and touching everything and you're bringing it home. Or here's one of the worst. Every once in a while, one of my patients will sneak a magazine into the bathroom, the worst. Or you'll get into a taxi in New York City, right? And it's wet. Ugh, the worst, right? So the thing is, you have to be prepared for whatever that is, meaning you have this Purell or whatever brand you use. And we also, we give out to our patients the spray because when you go someplace, okay, I want to spray down the surface, okay? When you go to a restaurant, okay, they're cleaning, you know, you don't know how clean that rag is. And then you're going to touch that. You're going to put that in your, in your, in your, you know, your system, does wearing a mask on an airline, so let's talk about flights for a second, okay? Flights are a particular problem for people. Why? Because they're working harder because of the altitude, but because it's recirculated air, right? So it's like, you know, we all are breathing what everybody else, I was on a flight from Peru, the person next to me had the flu. I knew I was getting sick. I did get sick, okay? Hospital masks, and, you know, I can send you some, on our website, we have a few articles that I wrote this year about the masks, okay? There are certain things. Now, a basic paper hospital mask is not gonna do much for you, okay? But there are good masks. There are things like VOG masks. There are things like, um, you know, there are other masks that I like where they have filters on them. The key is to have a good seal, okay? So a lot of people, you know, they're wearing these paper masks, but then they take it off and they put it in their bag and then they take it out and they put it on again and this and that. So first of all, if you're gonna use a paper mask, is it better than nothing? Yes. First of all, you have to make sure it's on right side up. A lot of people put the put them on upside down. You have to squeeze the nose, but that's going to be good for big par particulate matter, okay? Big dust. Um, big droplets, okay? But that's not going to be good for pollution. That's not going to be good for pneumonia or the flu, okay? For that, you need something a little bit more serious. And I, I suspect Eamon is about to, to put on his Halloween costume. Oh, I thought you were getting a mask. Um, I, I, I thought I had one in the box behind, but it's somewhere in the office. So the thing is that, you know, it is worthwhile, but even equally worthwhile when you get to your seat, okay? Spray the seat down spray the armrests down and people are going to look at you like you're a nut who cares okay who cares how they look at you because guess what you don't want to go to bermuda and spend the whole week in your hotel room because you're sick hey kid what you doing come here so the idea is take those wipes take those hospital sani wipes wipe the seat down 
Wipe the armrest down before you even sit down. Wipe down the, the, the magazine holder. Don't take anything in and out of it. Don't put your headphones or your glasses into that magazine holder. That Look, I've seen people stuff dirty tissues in those things. Okay, so now you put your glasses in there and guess what? That's how you get sick. So it's prevention. I was never a germaphobe before until I wrote the chapter on prevention of infection. And I am a germaphobe now and I haven't been sick in a long time. I, I avoid sick people like the plague. I if if there are kids who are sick, I stay I stay away from them. Um, but read the chapter. It's available for free on our website at pulmonarywellness.com. But there's a lot of things you can do, and it's a lot better to prevent an infection or the flu or a cold or virus um, than it is to treat it once you got it. And with pulmonary fibrosis or any type of respiratory disease or cardiac disease or anyone who's risk compromised, be it children or um, people you know undergoing cancer treatment or elderly. Um, you know, a cold for you is not the same as a cold for me. So protect your, your health like, you know, like it's really, it is really important, but protect it with all you've got. Okay. So a question from Christine, uh, uh, just some tips. Uh, she's hoping to get a uh, double lung transplant due to IPF. She's extreme fibromyal fibromyalgia. Any tips to help? Sure. So fibromyalgia is a, is a big challenge, okay, because, you know, the key is we want to get you moving, right, because you want to do well, at, you know, before, during, and after the transplant, um, but you have to be very, very careful um, with, excuse me for just one second, my dog is chewing the couch. Yeah, yeah. I adopted a new dog, and she's basically feral. She was... <laughs> really cute. She's getting better, but she's destroyed everything in my house. Um, so fibromyalgia, um, any type of polymyositis, uh, multiple sclerosis, anything where pain is a regular part of the, the chronicity of the, the disease, you have to be extremely careful, okay? And, you know, it, it, this is someplace where you really have to walk before you run or you really have to wade into the water a little bit at a time because it's not just you you may not feel the problem when you're actually doing it so you may feel perfectly fine during the workout you may actually even feel better during the workout because your joints are getting lubricated your muscles are getting warm but then a day or two later you may wind up in excruciating pain so the keys are you know, and, and again, it's a little bit different. It depends on how strong you are. I'm giving you a general tip right now, okay? It's, it's, I'd have to see, number one, we have to weigh out how much exercise you can do, be, you know, versus how much damage is it going to do to your joints, okay, and your, your muscles and how much of a payback. So you have to start off extremely slow. It's like throw a stone and wait to see the ripple, like we're not going to know right when we throw that stone how far that fibromyalgia is going to be affected by it. I would say initially start out with low impact activity. So don't start with the treadmill. I would only go to the treadmill after you've proven that you can handle the other stuff. So things like the upper body ergometer, no impact whatsoever. Um, things like the new step, things like the recumbent bike, things where you're moving, you know, individual joints or body parts, as opposed to just pounding your whole body at one time are going to be better to start. Now, I would also start with one, you know, with two days a week, with two days at least of rest in between to see how, that works. And, you know, as I say to people, each time you come back and tell us you felt well after the last workout, we give you a little bit more time and a little bit more intensity. But when you have a orthopedic or musculoskeletal problem like fibromyalgia or anything, it could be severe arthritis, it could be spinal stenosis, we have to take even slower steps and build up even more gradually over a longer period of time. Great. Um, so I think we're through most of the questions. Um, if there's any we've missed, um, uh, you know, we'll catch up with them on the Facebook comments. They'll, they'll keep coming through over the next few days as people, uh, watch, the, watch the broadcast. So we'll answer them. Uh, one that's coming in an awful lot, Noah, is thanks from people. 
Uh, so Joan wants you to open centers all over the world. Um, I would love, so listen, I would love to open, I get offers all the time, you know, from people to open centers. But like I said, I don't want to worry what's going on in Africa. You know, it's, it's like if I could get the right partners, I, I am more than happy to come. I have a, a program called Pulmonary Wellness, the Blueprint, and I'm happy to teach anybody and go places and teach programs how to run good programs. I don't want, once I've taught you and once you're up and running, I don't want to think about you anymore because believe me, it's, it's enough. My day to day is enough. It's like, I, I take it very seriously. I don't want to know that on the other side of the world, even while I'm sleeping, I'm responsible for somebody exercising. Um, but you know what, I, my goal in all this, and you know, it sounds crazy, but I've been able to reach more people through Facebook than I ever thought I could in my practice. Um, so my goal is to educate patients, to educate clinicians, um, and my team will travel. We teach people all the time how to open programs. But, you know, there was a time where I was I was going to open a second practice in Brooklyn. And um, there was one day where I was going. We, we started even building on it. And I got stuck in the tunnel for like an hour and 20 minutes while I was going from one practice to the other. And I had no communication with anybody. And I was like, this is definitely not a comfortable situation to be in. <laughs> So I'm willing to help anybody. I'm willing to consult with anybody. I'm good with one practice for now. But thank you. And you're welcome to come to New York. If people wind up in New York, I'm happy to see you and consult. If you don't have insurance or insurance doesn't cover it, I'm happy to see you on the house. Um, you know, but um, thank you. And email, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you, Empower. And thank you, Bill Vic, for uh, making this great introduction to us. And there's plenty of questions about the, the book, so we'll send a link to the, the book and to your website in, in the Facebook comments, uh, and we'll answer them over the next few days as well. All Noah, right. you've been amazing. Uh, the, there's so many comments of people thanking you, so just from Patient Empower and from everyone else, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.